you know, even if we don't have to wear masks anymore, we're still left with a kind of an infrastructure that used to barely exist now doesn't exist hardly at all. And uh, we need to support each other in this online realm. And it's a small world. It really is a small world. The people who like what we like, I mean, it's not like there's some endless number of them that we, so we can dispose of them. We need to take care of each other. Right. You jank. His website says, Taste, Tone, and Telecasters. First off, right there, I know I'm going to like the dude. <laughs> um, the two groups that kept him busy before the pandemic are Pearl Django, a Northwest Gypsy jazz group, a duo with guitarist Jamie Findlay, along with many solo guitar dates. He's a well-respected teacher with a very busy schedule of private lessons. Recently, that includes a relatively new masterclass courses with True Fire. I'll ask you about that later. Okay, thanks. He has taught at jazz guitar camps alongside Frank Vig Vignola, an instructional DVD for Hal Leonard Publishing, and is a regular communi uh, communist <laughs> columnist for Fingerstyle Guitar Journal. <laughs> Just for starters, you, you, you are, you're a busy guy. He lives in Tacoma, Washington. And even though I don't think I've ever met him, per, at least in person, I consider him a friend. Tim Lurch, welcome. Thank you, Adam. That's, that's nice. I, I, I have to admit, I'm not doing the column for Fingerstyle Journal anymore. Oh, you're not. Okay. I did a bunch of them and then it got, and also the previous um, version of the magazine. Uh, Bill Pyburn is a friend of mine. and uh, I'm, I'm not doing it anymore uh, because I just got too, bu too busy and I didn't feel like I could do a great job at it. So I let it rest for a while. I may pick it up again. I enjoy doing those. Um, but all the other things are true. In fact, Pearl Django is just starting to rehearse again after our time off. And um, we have some gigs in the books and we're ready to get back at it. Um, Jamie Finley and I are playing, are planning on playing again soon as well. And I'm also going to be playing some dates with John Stoll, hopefully in the next, uh, you know, a few months. Uh, he's uh, also out here in this area. So right. we're close enough by each other so we could, um, and we enjoy playing with each other very much. And so we're going to try and do some things on the West Coast. Oh man, John is a fantastic guitar player. I love John. Yeah, he's yeah. a good he's a good man and he's a beautiful player. So mm -hmm. That's a good combination as far as I'm concerned. I kind of came close, well, not super close, but I was thinking about studying with him possibly at whatever university it was. Uh, if I was going to end up doing a, a doctorate degree, I was hoping hoping that would work out, but mm. I I don't think I ever applied or anything like that. But it was oh. on my on on the back burner of of possibilities. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, um, uh, oh my God, my goodness, I've just lo lost his first name already, but uh, Pyburn. Oh, Bill. Bill. I've met Bill at the Chet Atkins Appreciation Con Society convention. Uh, yeah, I, I was hoping to go to that. Of course, you know, John Knowles, and, and in fact, recently, I think you guys chatted. Mm -hmm. uh, John is a pal of mine, and um, I've got this ever accumulating number of of good friends and that end up are living in Nashville. John's been there for many years and, uh, you know, folks who are more recently going there. And I feel like I haven't been to Nashville, so I got to get over there. And I had planned on going to the last July's um, Chet Atkins thing. And of course, nobody went anywhere that summer, uh, but I'm hoping to get there very soon. Right. Yeah. yeah the, time. I, the time that I was there would have been like early 2000s early to mid 2000s, somewhere in there uh, for about, I think three years in a row, I would go down and teach for like a, a guitar workshop. Mm -hmm. And I would hang out with Stephen D. Anderson, who knew Lenny Bro really well and lived with him and stuff. And yeah, he would take me around town and stuff. And I've never met Stephen, but I, I heard about him and, and I, I understand we recently lost him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, I think it was 
October, maybe. Yeah. One um, of the many guys. Yeah, yeah, one of the last few, <laughs> possibly, that actually knew him. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started playing guitar and how old were you? Well, I was, um, I really liked music and I thought, I thought about guitar a lot, even from when I was really young. Um, but I never, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't get a guitar until I was 12. I said, I had a paper route and, uh, I saved up my money and, and went down to Trainum's music and bought a, uh, I don't know, $120 nylon string guitar, um, which wasn't horrible. I don't have the story of, you know, a silver tone with two inch high action. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, but see, yeah, I played, I, that was my first guitar. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, uh, it wasn't really what I wanted. Um, you know, a nylon string guitar wasn't really what I was hearing in my head. I was hearing something like this. I just had that sound in my head when I was a little kid. Uh, my mom listened to country music on the radio, and so I think I might have gotten, uh, you know, some Buck Owens or something in there. Right. But, and, I, you know, and literally, Adam, you maybe have a similar story. Um, I just, as soon as I got a guitar, I was a guitar player. I mean, that's all I cared about. I, I, it was there was no turning back. Before that, I was kind of into sports and and I was uh, very interested in bowling, which was a hobby of mine. And uh, but when I got a guitar, everything else just sort of went by the wayside. <laughs> well, it did take a take a little while to kick in, because what? How old were you when you started playing guitar? When I started playing guitar, I first got my first guitar. I was. I, 12 or maybe just about ready to turn 13. Yeah, maybe if I was older, it, I, it would have took a stronger hold right away. Uh -huh. But I started when I was seven. Oh, so you were kind of, you were given lessons and you were kind of doing it because your folks wanted you to do it or something like that? Right, yeah. So probably it took two years before it really started to be like I was practicing on my own and uh -huh. and then... By the age of 10, I was learning stuff off my dad's records. By 12, I was already in the musician's union doing gigs. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't even have, <coughs> I'm from Canada. The social security version of Canada's is called a social uh, insurance number. And I had to apply for that before I could join the musician's union so I could get paid. <laughs> What kind of gig were you doing? It was all country and a little bit of like bluegrass, but mostly like just old country, Merle Haggard, that kind of stuff. And what kind of joints you know, were you playing in? Uh, well, first off, the joints were old folks' homes. Oh, okay. Like seniors' homes and stuff. Uh -huh. And then that graduated to private parties um, and then uh, weddings. You were, you were playing like with other kids, other kids your age or were you with adults? One adult. <laughs> and everybody else in the band were, was kids. Oh, neat. Yeah. So we, we uh, but it was a great learning experience because there was never a rehearsal. You just learned the song on the, on the, on the gig. And you just flew by the seat of your pants. And that was a, a good education, just yeah, having to do that. You know? That's right. That's how we kind of do it, right? That's when I kind of got forced to sing too, which I thought, oh. at the time, I, I hated it. Oh. But he made me sing backups for him. Uh -huh. So I learned harmony. I learned to hear stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you still sing? No, I kind of lost my voice because I, I just hadn't done it for years and years and years. Probably, mm -hmm. I stopped probably singing uh, the la last top 40 band that I was in in Toronto as a sort of sideline thing that I was doing. Well, so you know, was, for guys who play like us, being able to sing... You know, even a couple of tunes is really kind of good. You know, you know, Lenny had um, a, a pleasing voice. It wasn't the most cultured lead, lead voice, but he could sing in tune. And, and, and I think he made good use of that because there was always a moment during, you know, a gig when he would, when he would, you know, bring on a, a vocal tune or something. And, and I think that, that 
you know, it helped to enamor you to the audience a little bit, you know, being a mostly instrumental player. Yeah, it's nice right. to be able to sing some nice, you know, some quaint song or something or funny song or something like that. You know? the, the one thing that I still do, though, is especially on a gig is I'm always singing what I'm playing when I'm yeah. when I'm playing lines. I'm, I'm constantly do that. I do that, too. And, and I, I don't know if you could call it singing, but it's a kind of vocal utterance oh okay yeah <laughs> no i'm actually like hitting the pitches. you're actually hitting the pitches yeah. yeah i don't do the george benson thing although in the past i flirted with it i have the voice that would allow me to do it um but i primarily do it so that i connect my breathing to my playing same here your, your phrasing just takes on a whole different thing when you do that yeah i think so especially if yeah. you can do it at a level that is um integrated I, you know you could you could start trying to do it and of course like anything it's not always very good at the beginning but when it becomes integrated it, it definitely helps yeah it helps right. also cut the thinking down a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah well exactly because it everything starts to come out more naturally instead I, of like trying that. to think too far ahead of what's yeah. <laughs> what are some of your earliest influences um, Whether it be jazz or not. Yeah, well, it wasn't jazz at first. Um, uh, like every kid, I was listening to a lot of pop music. In fact, my earliest memories are a transistor radio and a, you know, uh, and a whatever, six, 1963 pop song, whatever it might have been. I'm sure I heard Beatles and Rolling Stones and, and things of that nature. But also, like I said, my mom liked... Uh, Country music and country music at that time in 19, you know, 60 to 65 was, the, you know, really not really good music. You know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Country music I like. Um, so I had that in there. And then, of course, whatever you we had limited TV in my house when I was a kid. We had a TV, but it was, you know, it was on maybe for a half an hour on a Sunday night, you know, or something like that. Uh, so I wasn't. And then later on, I started. um having a little more access to TV as a, you know, when I was you know, six or seven. And so I would hear things like, um, I remember hearing a cue and I'm pretty sure I heard this like when it, when I was young, I, I may have heard it like a little bit later than, than that too. But you know, like you see the Beverly Hillbillies or something. And so they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. And I found out later that, Howard Roberts was, and and maybe Barney Kessel, but sure, for sure Howard Roberts played guitar on, you know, in the studio band that they used for that show. And I have this very vivid memory of, of hearing something that really grabbed my ear. It was guitar playing, and it was just a like a six seconds when Jed Clampett was walking in the front door or something. Mm -hmm. And it was this sort of, you know... I don't I can I can only imagine reimagine it but like maybe it was something like uh like something like uh you know uh, uh, uh or something you know mm -hmm. some little thing or you know you right. know and it was you know clearly a pick style in my memory anyway it was a kind of jazz guitar sound and that really excited me and made me, I didn't know what it was. I hadn't really heard anything that I could associate, but I just loved that sound that I remember it making a big impact on me. Um, as far as musical influences, my first instrument was harmonica and singing. And so I got together with a friend and he would play drums and I would sing and play the maracas or play the harmonica so I learned how to play you know like Love Me Do by the Beatles and mm -hmm. that, you know how that had that harmonica yep. lick um, but I really wanted to play something I think I tried playing drums for a hot minute and it wasn't interesting and as interesting as I hoped it would be um, but then I wanted to play guitar so then that sound I heard on those country records and that that the, the kind of jazzier TV guitar that was played by Guys like Barney Kessel and 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 um, Howard Tommy Rock. Tedesco and Howard yeah Roberts. Tommy Tedesco maybe not as much because of what I know he did but yeah probably mm. 
it was a little earlier. Tommy came in a little later. Oh, okay. but, yeah, you're, yeah, you're probably this correct. Is like yeah, four sixty-five, um, and uh, you know the obvious ones: the Bonanza theme and the Peter Gunn and all the all the Route sixty-six and all the spy shows and you know those all had kind of this quintessential sort of California um, cool jazz slash. Uh, Mickey Spillane style blues, you know, uh, yeah. and I like that a lot, and, and it definitely influenced me. I can t I can feel it coming back into my consciousness, you know, as an adult, you know, those mem early memories. Well, that was back when TV themes and and stuff like that, and all the little things, the little nuggets, the sound nuggets that they put in in TV shows and movies is almost a thing of the past. It's it's don't really do well. That it, well, it's not so a thing of the past, except that when we hear it, we're hearing like somebody on their iPad with, with GarageBand putting a string. Well, right. Well, that's what I meant. Of, yeah. of, of but it, real people playing. You're less right. interesting and real people playing. <laughs> and also, another yeah. thing to remember, I I I kind of did a little bit of research, but it it turns out that a lot of the early studio California studio guys were. Um, in that era, in the late 50s and early 60s, were jazz guys who, you know, probably cut their teeth in New York or something and then came out to California looking for greener pastures, you know, right? and got in the studios. And those of them who didn't have a drug habit or something, you know, and, and could read well, stayed in the studios at least for a period of time. Um, you know, there's fa then, you know, the famous guys like like Barney and Howard and... Uh, Ray Brown even did a fair amount of that stuff, and um, Plas Johnson was a, was the saxophone player who who did the Pink Panther theme among mm -hmm. many 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 other things. Right. Um, it's also funny. I I discovered um, that in those days, if a show was uh, playing year after year, they would always re-record the theme every year so that they could re-establish um, payment for the musicians. And so if you hear, you know, a lot of times you you hear in these, you know, chronicles of this stuff, so-and-so played on on the Bonanza theme, and then so-and-so played on the Bonanza theme, and then so-and-so played on the Bonanza Well, they always had three or four guitars on those dates, and then they recorded it every year, re-recorded it. So maybe maybe 15 or 20 guys got, got to say that I played guitar on the Bonanza right. theme. And it was true, you know. And, but, um, and they but, actually got paid for it because nowadays they try to not to pay the musicians. Tell me about it. I yeah. I get, I I have a little my my toe in that sort of TV and 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 you know uh, TV and film world just for some of the things that I do. And every once in a while I'll get a call for, you know, hey, we need you know pretty solo guitar. And I'll say, well, nothing in the catalog looks good. No, no, we want something that sounds like. Uh, a, a version of Ray Charles's "Hallelujah, I Love Her So," but it can't be that, because they don't want to pay. For, they don't want to pay royalties on an actual song. You know these kind of types of things, and, and you know it. It just it, I do it, but it's not. It's not. You can't make a living, right? <laughs> Unless you now, do it on a very large scale. Now, something just like that. I'm going to ask you. You probably just went in and improvised something then. Yeah, I'd have a maybe. I'd have a chord progression. And then that's your that's my strategy is I take a chord progression maybe the same chord progression to Hallelujah I love her so because that's something that's it's got well they that's what they asked for and then I would just improvise a uh, an alternate melody to it um, hinting at the original enough so that people yeah. could. Um, another thing that was happening in Hollywood and we and we you know when we were listening to TV and 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 uh, movies in those days in the early late 50s and early 60s, there were a lot of um, expatriate uh, Russian composers who came to New York and or Hollywood, and they were high class, very, very top notch classical guys. And they were writing, you know, theme shows for movies or I mean, I mean, for TV theme songs for, for TV or, or soundtracks for movies. And there's some funny oddball, you know, kind of low end, low budget B or C movies, but they have right. this incredible music on them because these guys were all working, you know. So anyway, that was, those are the earliest influences. And I My, think I heard you say somewhere before that Ted Green, maybe you were talking to Ted Green on the phone or something and he 
He said, excuse me, I have to flip the tape over or yeah, whatever. The, the first he... conversation I had with Ted, he was recording a Jim, Jimmy Cagney movie because he liked the music. And I, I, that's one of the things I liked about Ted or that made me realize he might be a guy who I could, you know, have a good uh, a relationship with is that, that, um, you know, he, he thought about music and he was influenced by a lot of the same stuff, you know, um, he was really strongly influenced by, um, uh, sh shows, you know, uh, play, you know, whatever, Broadway shows. I wasn't so much, but he, he really was. Um, and uh but i really love tv and movies and um there's a kind of cinematic orchestral quality that i really enjoy um but i mean sort of look at the guitar it really influences me to look at the guitar sort of orchestrally if you mm -hmm. i can't really think of a better way to describe it you know where uh, paying attention to which what the voices are do re actually doing you know right uh, rather than just lumping a bunch of you know standard chords um, so that was that. And then I started playing guitar. I immediately got enamored with blues. And I, I rem you know, I went through a big Lightning Hopkins phase and, a, and a, really anything with a guitar on it. I heard, I don't know how I ended up, I think I bought a record. If I, as I remember it correctly, I bought a record for my dad. And my dad was totally not musical. And so I don't know why I did this. <laughs> but I bought a, an Art Tatum Trio record. And it had Tiny Grimes and Slam Stewart. So, you know, I'm, I've just been playing for about a year and I get this record and I hear this really great sort of early jazz guitar. And it's like, oh, that's what that's the thing, you know. Mm. And then, of course, Charlie Parker was huge for me. Um, all the guitar players that we love, you know, Lenny and George Barnes, Lanny Bro, uh, Herb Ellis, Barney Kessel. Howard Roberts, Jim Hall, I love Jim Hall, Ed Bickers. Same here, yeah. All those guys, the the guys who didn't. I wasn't as interested in the on the the real flashy or or chops guys. Um, I really liked chords. I really liked the harmony, that um, and I liked melodies that I could understand. So. Yeah, Jim like, Hall or, fits in that category yeah. perfectly. Same yeah. with Ed Bickert. Yeah. And I love George Barnes. He made a, some records with Ruby Braff. Did you ever hear those records? No, I don't think so. Well, check them out if you get a chance. It's the George Barnes Ruby Braff Quartet. And uh, they, it was, it was uh, bass, rhythm guitar, playing sort of 4-4 four, four style for the most part. Mm -hmm. A guy named Wayne Wright, who played, was a left-handed guy, played a D'Angelico or something. It just got that great sound. George Barnes on electric guitar and Ruby Braff, a trumpet player, cornet player. And they just played perfectly it was swung hard and it mm -hmm. made sense to a you know to an unsophisticated listener um and i know it was really hip because i kept listening to it and now i can look back on, on it and see how hip it really was but i just liked it because it sounded cool um i went yeah, through well, a clapton it, phase and all that kind of stuff but i never could connect to rock and roll so i was always a little bit off in the in the the wilderness you know i liked uh like Blind Blake and that whole Kicking Mule records. Do you know Stefan Grossman? Yeah, yeah, I know well, of Stephen him. had all those records, and they had Tab inside and stuff. So I was really into that acoustic finger-picking thing for a, 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 a early on. You know, I could go on and on, but you yeah. know, that's kind of the story of the early years. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, as a guitarist, we typically have to play many different styles over the years to pay the bills. Yeah. What have you done over the years that's totally different than what you do today? And do you think those things shaped, good or bad, who you are as a player today? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'm curious to answer, to have you answer that too. So I'll take my turn and then you know, we'll get back and you can sure. tell me yours. But, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit of a late bloomer, uh, unlike you, who, who really seem like you got locked into a professional playing thing. It took me a while to figure out how to do it. You know, like how to, what, what do you do to get a gig? Who, who do you call? Where do you stand? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I played a lot of solo guitar because I, you know, I didn't like, um, you know, at that time, my friends were playing Kiss and Aerosmith and Ted Nugent. And I didn't have any interest in that kind of stuff. And they didn't have any interest in, that weird music that I liked, you know, I mean, my brother went to Mexico 
when I when he was let's see how did it work? He was maybe eighteen and I was right at the beginning. So he's six years older than me. So he's eighteen and and I'm twelve or thirteen. And he goes to Mexico and says, "Hey Timmy, take care of my records for me." And he had worked at a record store. And, and he had a very eclectic, he had all the hippie stuff that, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young and all that kind of stuff, which I listened to. But I also, he had like Louis Armstrong and Thelonious Monk and and oh, cool. uh, maybe even an Ornette Coleman record. Because at that time, you know, it was all jumbled together. If you were an interested, if you were a teenager interested in music, um, especially, you know, slightly, you know, my brother's age, there might be all kinds of stuff in there. Just, you know, Folkways records and Frank Zappa records and everything in between, you know? Right. Um, so I listened, I loved listening to music and I listened to, to a lot of really cool music, but not hardly any, uh, what you might think of as the, the music that my friends were listening to. And, and then you grew up in a great time with AM radio because it played yeah. a varied am amount of music. Like you could hear a country tune and then a flamenco tune and then something else right after, yeah. you know, right. it was, it was just like a normal thing. And that's probably why people didn't think twice about having a Charlie Parker record and then a St Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young record and a Frank Zappa record or whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah and I, I, I didn't understand or appreciate all of it, but I listened to it all and I, and, I, and it went in like Monk is all, ha, was, had a big impact on me and it continues to be to this day. But your question was not about that. Um, your question was about gigs. And so I started doing little performances. I don't know if they were gigs or not, but I remember doing, you know, playing two songs on a, on a talent show and then, you know, or, yeah. you know, a school presentation. I was in the, the, later on, I was in the high school jazz band and we did, gigs of various kinds and then there was a little combo that got created by the rhythm section and a soloist and we did some other things outside of school um and um and then I, I have just done so much stuff but you're right i've done a lot of things um not knowing like i remember i had a funny this really cracks me up <laughs> i didn't know how to be in a band i'd never been in a band and so i i got into a band because I could play, you know, and somebody said, we were at our first rehearsal and somebody said, do you know such and such a song? And of course I say, yeah, I know that one. So the singer starts singing and I start playing and she's singing the melody and I'm playing the melody along with her. Right. Right. Because that's what. I, I didn't know you didn't do that. You know, I didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't occur to me. So we get Unless to the, the vocalist wants you to do yeah, it. Right, you don't right, do right. that. Yeah. But we get to the end of the song and I don't know why they put up with me until the end of the song, but the drummer says, are you planning on playing the melody along with the singer? <laughs> kind of incredulously. And I said, right. uh, uh. <laughs> I learned, I learned as you go, as we do, I learned from that, but, um, but it was funny now that I think back on it. Uh, you know, so I did all sorts of stuff, you know, um, blues bands and, classic rock bands but i always wanted to play jazz and so then i started playing jazz in jazz groups i either i would put them together or something and we'd play whatever you know parties or clubs or whatever we could play like everybody i guess right but nothing really where i locked into something and i just you know played every every friday and saturday night you know to a packed joint or something like that because i wasn't mm -hmm. i didn't really want to play the kind of music that allowed that i never wanted to play top 40 i avoided playing top 40 actually um, right. but to make a long story short i played all kinds of gigs man i would always play jazz to the extent that i could like a tuesday night or something like that and then i'd play stuff whatever i could get hired i got hired to play in a russian all russian band at the saint petersburg tea room at the top of the beverly center in in hollywood by the time i moved there and I was the only American guy or English speaking guy. And some of they might have been naturalized citizens, but it was a real Russian place. And I played only Russian music and European pop songs and things like that, all by ear, you know, no charts, no nothing. So that was an education, you know. You gotta know mm -hmm. you gotta know how to play Autumn Leaves in every key and play that game because <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. That all those songs, as soon as they go, they go, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I tried to do whatever I could to avoid, you know playing Madonna songs or whatever. 
in a top 40 band. Right. Um, so I played country music. I got into, you know, during what I call the Garth Brooks scare of the early 90s, I was playing a lot of country music and, and also trying to play jazz, you know, on the off nights or, or solo guitar. I made a, you know, all, an attempt at, you know, filling in the calendar with solo guitar gigs. It's kind of like what I still do. Um, but the, the real question is, how does all that apply to or reflect on what I do now? And I think that having been on bandstands in all, usually as a sideman in all capacities, good, bad, and, and ugly, um, you know, thankfully I started playing in better and better bands and I actually got better and better myself. And, and it didn't happen overnight though. Cause like I said, I'm a bit of a late bloomer. Um, but, uh, it, it taught me a lot because like, for instance, when I play solo guitar, I, I, I never play this sort of waffly tempo style. I'm all, I always want to, I mean, I'm, I'm happy playing rubato and I'd love that if it's done well, yeah, but I yeah. also don't play rubato as a, as a cop out because I can't play in time, you know? Right. Um, I like, I like to swing. I like to, I like to feel a groove um, as much as, as, um, anything else. And, and I play, uh, I want to have a good feeling, you know, I want someone who isn't a musician to just, if they, all they get is that good feeling, you know? Right. Uh, and, uh, and when you were saying you were li about some of that older music that you were listening to, uh, with Ruby, uh, saxophone player and the George, was it, what was George, the guitar Barnes, guitar? George Barnes, like it just felt so good probably. Right. It just, it's yeah. like they were probably grinning from ear to ear when they're playing it and just having a great time. And everybody that's... in the audience was too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I just like that feeling. I, if, if somebody comes in, if I'm playing and somebody walks in the room and I can feel, I can see their body kind of doing that. I know I'm doing my job, you know, uh, right. no one's going to come in and go, you know, well, not, well, maybe they would, but like they start <laughs> taking out their notebook and writing down the melodic minor, you know, observations, but they're going to dig it if it's groovy. And, and I don't think it has to, it's one or the other. I think you can play, you know, harmonically sophisticated music and melodically interesting music and improvised music and also still have it feel good. I totally agree yeah. because there's a lot of like more modern jazz that's out, contemporary jazz that um, it seems like it's math to me. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. no, they're, they're not worried about the groove. They're worried about, patterns and and, Could be, and yeah. and then sometimes it's there's plenty of groove and then there's math on top of it i but i definitely sometimes, want to hear yeah. something from the chin down you know i want to hear something that affects something besides just the intellect and 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 I, like i said i don't mind uh, you know and i like pensive music i really love bill evans especially the pensive version of bill evans mm -hmm. you know um I really love that, and there's nothing wrong with that, and and I and I I don't mind, you know, I, I love rubato, I love a, 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 an open floating feeling, but but I also love, you know, you know, beautiful medium swing, you know, you know what I yeah. mean. Yeah, and I no, want I... to have all of those things in my musical life, um, but I know what you mean about the 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 stuff that gets a little too intellectual. Um, so how is it for you in in terms of how did, how, how, tell me about how it went from a, a little boy playing country music at a old folks home to being a guy that could manage a seven string guitar and playing, you know, f sophisticated harmonies and things. Oh boy. Do you have a, two hours? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> I don't um, know. it's your deal. <laughs> um, well, let's see. I mean, yeah, I mean, kind of like you, I was at the tail end of the AM radio. Mm -hmm. It was still varied. It was kind of just as FM was coming on the scene. and Yeah, the early days of FM were pretty cool, too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's true. Um, so it was a lot of whatever was on the radio, because the radio was on a lot in my house. Yeah. And same with the records. Like, both my parents loved music. So it was a lot of, like, uh, anything... I would, and I would listen to stuff off my dad's record collection too. Anything from the ventures to Johnny cash to, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and then there's uh, Lester flat and Earl Scruggs. Mm -hmm. That was probably a very big influence on me. Yeah. Cool. You know? Um, 
and then later probably came the Beatles. And uh, believe it or not, I, I almost would have preferred, even at a very young age, just instrumental music because <laughs> I always thought the singing got in the way of uh, the music is what I would thought at the time, you know? Yeah. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I would just zone the vocals out. Even at a young age, I would be more interested in hearing what the drums and the bass and the uh -huh. guitar are doing or whatever, you know? That's um, good. That's good uh, stuff to have in, in, in your consciousness because later on you, you start looking like a guy who knows how to put an arrangement together, you know? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I started uh, a jam with some next door neighbor kids. We were all roughly around the same age. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a guy that kind of sort of went into retirement from bands and stuff that just played sort of like semi-professionally or whatever, decided, hmm, these guys sound pretty good for kids. I think I'll get back into the thing and I'll just make them my band. So that's well, basically what he did. Okay, cool. And he's the one that made us join the musicians union because we're going to get paid and you, you know, you're going to pay into the, the fund and, and retirement and all that stuff. <coughs> um, and, and basically from age 12 to 20, by the time I went off to college to study jazz, it was a lot of that kind of thing. Yeah. I call it the critter circuit. We're playing all the moose and elks and, and, and yep. Eagles clubs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or like in my case, because I lived in a out in the country in a rural situation, it, it could be like you travel an hour and a half or two hours back in the middle of nowhere and there's a hall. All right. <laughs> and yep. it's there's no liquor license. So you're, you're not they're not allowed to have liquor there. So everyone would go back in the car <laughs> and drink themselves silly while the band was taking a break and come in and then they hoop it up, you know. Yeah, that's funny. just to things like that. And then um, it kind of that, that kind of ended when I went to Toronto to uh, start trying to study jazz. But even before that, I kind of was getting into ZZ Top, Aerosmith, and then somehow Van Halen made it made his way to my All right. So uh, seven or eight or something. Well, like I came that. in a little bit late on that because it, the, all that stuff was totally off my radar. Oh, okay. I was like playing country music. And so like Alabama was probably one of my yeah, favorite right. bands or something at the time, you know? So, uh, all of us, so I started branching off with branching out a little bit to ZZ top and, and some Aerosmith. It was kind of bluesy rock. Yeah. And then Van Halen just came along and then I just went all in like, Oh, cool. With that. Yeah. So, so did you I get a stupid guitar and a and a whammy bar. No, but he did influence me in other ways. Like, he, he, I, he, um, sort of influenced me to build a guitar. And that's another sort of thing that that I do is either work on guitars or build guitars or have oh. built guitars. Like I ba basically built myself a guitar in in woodworking class in oh, high school. Cool. Shop class, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I ordered a neck from Warmoth and then I just built everything else and put all the parts together. Great, great. So, and, and uh, you know, Eddie Van Halen probably in influenced me in many, many, many ways, even though I don't play anything like him. Well, but you know, in some, ways, in some ways, Eddie is amongst his peers. He's the hippest rhythm guitar player. Ooh, yeah. You know, by far. And, and in some ways, the swingingest soloist yeah you know and you know i don't think he thought of it himself that way but but yeah he he his time feel was so a big part of what we like about him you know there's a lot of a lot of guys of course he had a beautiful tone a beautiful sound he came up with interesting and wonderful parts but if you listen to him next to a lot of the guys who were trying to be like him in the in the subsequent years there were only one or two that really got um, the substance of what I think really made him unique, which was um, his time feel. Yep. The notes, everybody could get the notes. Everybody can go wiggly wiggly and stuff. But uh, there were only a couple of guys from you know my observation who got even close to Eddie's 
sense of the groove and the swing that he put into it. Yeah, and the thing is, it's not perfect, but it that's what the feel is all about. Right. Have you <laughs> seen that feel. video of the guy that quantized? I was just going to mention that, and it just ruins everything, doesn't it? Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if... I mean, it's one thing if you're listening to a click and you're playing to the click and then, you know, wiggling a little bit around. But to, to play without a, a, a click in sight, play just how you felt and then have somebody come back later and quantize it. Oh, my God, it it it, uh, it really ruined. You know? And the yeah. other thing that that people don't usually take into account, it wasn't just Eddie, but it was Alex, his brother, the drummer, that also was part of the. That's the right. Puzzle that they interlock together so well, and that's probably why he had such a uh, respect and and um, and a you know and a knack for for the timing is they played together since they were kids and and it was just you know built into their whole learning process you know yeah and I because Alex was older than Eddie he did some gigs with his dad with their dad like some jazz gigs. So I uh -huh. think that's where the swing comes from. Yeah. You know, and then, then probably them just hearing records and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I guess I could say it was through Eddie where I think I was reading like in a guitar player magazine or something where he was talking about uh, Alan Holdsworth. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's like, well, if Eddie Van Halen says this guy is the heaviest thing since sliced bread, I, I better buy some music oh what did you what was the first thing you got it was um it was it was earlier on it wasn't road games was but it, it was metal, a, a tavic a tavacron was one of them uh -huh. and then the one before metal fatigue yeah, metal fatigue yeah 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 i was aware of alan holsworth um certainly from the red iou album which was it used to be black and then it was red um and then also prior to that he was in Bruford and a couple of those all-star mm -hmm. fusion bands that were, you know, coming up. But yeah, I, I, I especially liked, for me, the, the perfect sweet spot for Alan was that IOU record. Something about the tone was still human and the tunes were, you know, it had that singer that sounded a little bit like Jack Bruce uh, on a couple of tunes. And so it's still trying to be a little bit of a rock album, you know, mm -hmm. but I just love that record. I loved all of them, but I felt like they, they got a little more machine like as he went along. Right. <laughs> you know, and, um, but, but yeah, Alan was a phenomenal player, beautiful, phenomenal player. I especially really, really appreciate his chordal intros. Yeah. Uh, for me, that was, you know, his, maybe his sort of most profound innovation is, playing like that not necessarily the the legato flashier melody stuff all yeah he that. just he just viewed the guitar neck in a completely different way from being self-taught mostly mm -hmm. and i think that's you know why he just didn't sound like anybody else either <laughs> well, you could you could have done worse by going from being in a country band to like an eddie van halen to getting into alan holdsworth that's a pretty good that's a pretty good trajectory as far as i'm concerned <laughs> and so when i first put on i think it was metal fatigue i was like oh my god like my jaw dropped on the floor and i went i know nothing about music i have to go to school and figure out what he's doing oh good did it work Be because i i equated that as jazz at the time because jazz Correct. was not on my radar whatsoever oh, okay and i still don't know what he's doing to this very day <laughs> well i have an idea but yes. we but all, uh we all have our ideas <laughs> yeah 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 exactly um, but can I play like him and do I play like him? No, but, no. but it did set me on the path to start wanting to learn jazz. Cause I, at the time I thought, well, if I can play jazz, it'll make me such a well-rounded musician. I'll be able to play anything. Yeah. I even knew that at 19, <laughs> uh, but the jazz bug kind of took and, and, uh, and uh, then the rest is history. After is that, you got out of school and you started playing on whatever, you know, wedding right. bands and whatever else you had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of almost back like before i would take anything yeah i would play reggae with with um like jamaicans like the real deal yeah, or great that's really good because in high school i was listening to like 
Bob Marley while everybody else was listening to um, Black Sabbath and whatever. I, it just wasn't my thing. Yeah, Bob Marley records were one of the things I I got hip to from my brother's record collection. He had like the first, he had about maybe a dozen reggae records. The the the, the really important first twelve reggae records you ought to mm -hmm. have. And I I got caught by it, man. I really got caught by it. Mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, concrete jungle. I mean, that's just a great record. <laughs> record. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, back to my original question of, about making you who you are today, all of that stuff is in there somewhere. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. And yeah, it does. And I mean, old school R and B and, and, um, uh, you know, the, the Jimi Hendrix, uh, Curtis Mayfield, Jimi Hendrix, uh, oddly enough, Floyd Kramer, uh, Cornell Dupree, uh, uh, Reggie Young, interconnection from all of those guys that played these little triadic parts and would hammer. You know that stuff. You know that's yeah. that for me. That's a deep vein that that runs through all of this, all of that that I really love, and I love to try and do it. Like I don't even sell. A lot of guys will just go. You know. And then they know it. They know how to do a couple of them in E or whatever. Right, I right. sort of see all of this, you know. You know, I see that as being some a lot of the same, the same DNA. Right. You know, all that stuff. So I just for just me, a that, little, just a little more uh, harmonically sophisticated. That's right. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. But for me, it's a it's it's where harmony and melody co mingle. Um, and I, that for me is just a fascination that the, 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 what I, I term it fluid harmony. So it's not just rhythm guitar where you got a chunk of something and you're banging on it. And it's not just melodies that you're going diddly diddly. It's where those two things come together. And it's always been a fascination, whether it be Joe Walsh playing in the James gang or, or Joe pass and right. all of the Joe's in between. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, speaking of, um, you know, we talked about Ted before, Ted Green. Mm -hmm. um, you studied with some of the jazz royalty of guitar, I would say. Uh, I was very fortunate to at least, at least, if not study with, hang around or be in the same room as or take a few lessons from many, many wonderful players. And, you know, Did you ever get to, oh, sorry. Did you ever get to take a lesson with Lenny? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, in fact, on a number of occasions, um, the, I was aware of Lenny and was a fan of his. Um, I was probably going to GIT at the time or maybe just before. Um, and I heard, no, I must have been going to GIT at the time because I heard about that a guy, his name was, his last name was Rose, maybe Paul Rose or David Rose, Tim Rose. He was a Hollywood music guy maybe a guitar player i can't remember but he was hosting lenny on a one of lenny's trips to la and while lenny was in town he was looking to pick up some some bread and um i don't know if he had a gig or not actually uh, but i heard that you know i could take a lesson from lenny i got the number and i called i don't think i talked to lenny i think i talked to this guy mr rose and he set it up and I drove up to his house in the valley and 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 had my first lesson with Lenny, which lasted the better part of an afternoon. And we had a very nice time. Right. Um, and uh, that was the first time I met him. And then I would go see him at Dante's when he came, either came back to town and started establishing a little bit of, uh, you know, residency and, and we'd play at Dante's and occasionally show up at G.I.T., um, so it wasn't too long after that. Um, and so, uh, then I went over to, he got an apartment in the, this was probably after I went to GIT, after I finished, cause I met him there and I met him a number of times. I remember going out to lunch with him and Joe DiOrio and they were two little guys. Yeah. <laughs> I was this sort of 
taller, lanky, skinny kid. And, you know, we're walking, you know, with each one of them on either side of me down the street in Hollywood to this little luncheon place that we were, you know, I just was like, oh, God, I, I, that was like one of those, I could have died and gone to heaven kind of moments because it was, there were two, you know, my two idols. One uh, meek and mild guy and another feisty Italian. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And Lenny could be feisty too if he, you know, <laughs> with the right combination of, right. of issues. But um, anyway, then I, uh, I, I got, I got his new phone number and he had a, I lived in Hollywood. This must have been 80, 84 still. Um, and uh, I would go over to his apartment in Wilshire, where his, he lived up on the, you know, I don't know where we're, 12 floors up or something. And so, um, sorry think, to cut you off, but is that, is that the building where he died? Yeah, I was just going to oh, say, I take no, no pleasure in this at all. Yeah, I was there. I was at his house on the Thursday afternoon before he was killed on Ooh. the Saturday. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm, he showed me the pool. He was very proud. He was tan. tan. He had been hanging out by the pool. And the pool was on the top of the building, which is very odd. This is an old hotel that they had turned into an apartment complex or an apartment, you know, in Wilshire, the Wilshire District. And I take the bus over there and hang out. And I probably visited him, I don't know, three or four times there. And I was at his, I was there on a Thursday night. I had a seven string nylon string guitar uh, made by a, a Dauphin, I think was yeah, the name. You may have heard about this. I don't know if it was made by them or at least marketed by them. And he was playing his Kurt Sand guitar, um, which he let me play, which I was quite fascinated by. And we had a beautiful afternoon. I mean, the thing about Lenny is it wasn't like he was teaching one lesson after another. You went over to his house and <coughs> and you just spent the afternoon hanging out. And I'd just give him as much money as I had. You know, it was supposed to be $60, but I'd give him, you know, try to scratch up as much as I could because I knew he right. was, uh, you know, one time Lenny called me up on the, on the phone. The phone rings, I pick it up. Hey, hey, like, like, look like Tim. Hey, look, look like you want to, you want to have a lesson, man? And uh, I said, oh, man, Lenny, I don't have the car today and I got a rehearsal I got to go to. I'm really, really sorry, man. Uh, I'd love to come over. Let's put something in the book for, for later. All right, and he hangs up. About 10 minutes later, Phone rings again, and I pick it up. She says, hi, is this Tim? Woman on the phone. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. She goes, do you know where Lenny is? It was his wife. Right. And and I, who knows what was going on, but she was looking for him. He had just left, and her my name was probably still sitting next to the phone. She called me looking for him. So that kind of gave you a little sense of right. what the, the dynamic might have been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, I've heard some stories that I won't get right, into. Yeah. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be the guy that tells more of those stories. But yeah, I was, I liked Lenny and, and, and um, he was into, you know, he knew I was a Ted guy because I studied with Ted. And so I think he had, you know, enough respect for me and uh, for what I might, you know, have already gotten to on the guitar. And, but I was specifically asking him about, you know, things that he was doing and harmonics and, and playing the seven string. So I think he, he gave me a little, you know, he wasn't just sort of doing it for the dough. I think that, you know, he clearly was enjoying himself and we, you know, he would like literally would be, you know, a three hour lesson or something like that. Cause we were in, you know, diving into it and getting into it. Right. And that's the kind of, I think that's how he learned music too, is just hanging out and, and, and do, you know, trying to figure stuff out and asking questions, <laughs> jamming. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I was really broken up about Lenny for a very, very long time. I've kind of digested it a little bit now, but uh, you know, that was a big, that was a big thing for me. Yeah. I, I, I regret that I never, ever got a chance to meet Lenny. And I told, uh, both John Knowles this, and I also told, uh, Emily, his daughter, this, she interviewed me a while back, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, actually. Um, and even though I never met Lenny, not even related to him, but he always seemed like my older brother <laughs> for, for some reason that I like my, you know, guitar buddy that I never, ever got a yeah. chance to meet or something like that. Cause yeah. he, cause it just resonated with me so much because 
when I was a kid, my first guitar hero was Chet Atkins as well. And Oh, there you go. You know what I mean? So I was like, and then like, oh, you know, I just, it just made sense. He's taking the Chet Atkins thing and mixing it with Bill Evans and, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, you know, that the, the Chet, I mean, the, the Lenny thing, all the Chet thing too, but I wasn't a Chet guy so much, although I loved him. I played some of his, some things, but I wasn't deep into it. But the Lenny thing, you know, it's really interesting. It's like this brotherhood, you know, the first time I met John Knowles, all we had to do was say the word Lenny and all of a sudden we were like blood brothers, you know, it really was a bonding issue between the two of us. And uh, uh, it, it's, you know, it's a special, small world of, I think, um you know special people <laughs> yeah oh, and i'm surprised that there's a lot more people know about him now i think yeah. mostly from the work of his daughter emily yeah, emily couple... really has done a beautiful job and in yeah. in and, 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 uh, i think it's a kind of a selfless task as well because you know you know she's not uh, i think she's probably losing more money than she's making on all this stuff and on her projects but it it it, it was really wonderful to uh watch her first movie and get you know, get a sense of, you know, how wide his appeal was. Right. I mean, Ted wouldn't stop talking about him, you know. In fact, I got, I have something I'll share with you after. Yeah, uh, sure. I'll tell you about it after. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it's a secret, but uh, um, you'll, you'll dig it. And because Ted was such an, ad, you know, admirer of Lenny and um, also really learned what Lenny was doing and, and, you know, put it together in his own, in, in Ted's own way. Right. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I kind of, even though Aunt Lenny's probably been the biggest influence on my playing, I don't think I do any things exactly like him. So yeah, who could, I, I, yeah, well, that's true too. <laughs> yeah. But you, you know, know what? I'm always, you know, I got to tell you, this is personal, <laughs> you know, about me, but not, not really more about me than about anybody else. But I don't. Really, I almost get mad when I hear somebody who's, who's, um, playing like somebody else and and really not finding themselves. Yeah. You know, like I've heard a few people that play just like so and so or so and so, and I never really. It, it, I, I mean, I'm either very neutral about it or kind of bothered by it. So I, but I really love it if I hear somebody where I can hear the the echoes of their influence. You know, like yeah. I can tell if someone's a Lenny guy who's done more than just rip off the, the ripples, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and yet I don't want to really hear someone just being a clone. You know, like when I hear you play, I, I, I agree with you. You don't sound like Lenny, even though you use a lot of the same mechanisms. But but, um, you know, the thing that's interesting is, oh, what did this guy do with our common influence? You know, with right. our common. Uh, that, so that for me is is don't feel sorry for it. You know, don't apologize for not sounding like me. Yeah, no, that's true. Because you, you summed it up really well. It's just like, well, who can? <laughs> only Lenny, right? Um, I, I've got only two gear kind of questions. Okay. The first one is, what is it about the telly that you like so much? It seems to be your go-to guitar. It is. I've been, uh, yeah, I definitely, I've been playing more archtops lately because the band I'm in is, that's the role. But, and I've come, I had originally played an ES-175 was my first good and, and long lasting guitar. Um, then I switched over to Fenders because, the, you know, to make a living in the time I was coming up, you needed, you couldn't do it on an ES-175. And I, I, wasn't a Les Paul guy, so I always had some sort of Fender variant of one kind or another. And usually it was a, you know, a Fender with a humbucker in the back or something, you know. Less fragile, too. Yeah, they're smaller, right. they're e you're easier to pack in a van and you can right. throw them around. Yeah, they never right. get damaged. Yeah. Very, very interested in lugging around a nine pound guitar, you know, <laughs> around like that. Um, but uh, you know, I Ted was an influence. Ed Bickard was an influence. I just love the way they sounded, and I realized that in order to sound that way, there's something about the scale length and something about the construction of a Telecaster. For years, I played Stratocasters because it was a um, uh, it was a guitar that I was just had ended up with and got comfortable with. Um, and uh, but I finally settled on Telecasters, although I do funny things to them, right. You know? 
some there are some perversions here, but uh, as George Harrison alluded to, uh, <laughs> but for for me the 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 simplicity of it, the fact that Telecaster makes you work a little bit, and in working you sound you end up sounding like yourself. So, you know, I mean. I don't know if somebody's personality would come through as much on a Les Paul, but but the, the personality of the player comes through on a Telecaster even more than a Stratocaster because of the fact that you really have to work to get it to sing. Mm. And then how you work is, you know, what kind of work you do to get it to sing is sort of personal, right? Right. That's for me. And then just this, you know, like just this sound. Uh, let's see if I can play something pretty. Uh... That sound. I mean, I just don't think you can get it on another guitar. You know, there's. It's just that church. You know. I I always say Leo Fender got it right the first time. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And even to the extent that a lot of the the later innovations didn't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not a snob about 52 tellies or something, but I do feel like the simpler the better. In fact, if someone said you can have any guitar from the Fender line right now, not custom shopped. Well, first of all, I would throw away anything with polyurethane on it. Right. That would be off the list. And then I would be left with primarily uh re relatively inexpensive guitars that are being made in mexico because they have different environmental laws there so they can spray nitro right and i so you know the way i look at it is in in 1955 probably almost everybody working in the fender factory was of mexican american heritage right and they were near they you know they were in california and it was just right that was the that's that's kind of just the history. So a, a factory that's across the border in Mexico, <laughs> I don't have any problem with that. In fact, mm -hmm. I probably prefer it because right. you can upgrade any of the switches or any of the pickups or any. And I always do that anyway. Mm -hmm. So the good old the good body and a nitrocellulose lacquer and a nice, you know, a, a good full figured neck that, you know, isn't all slimmed down and you know, and compound radius and all that yada yada that you get on the, you know, the American made anything with the word plus after it. I say, no, I don't want anything. Yeah. So yeah, I, I like the old stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, my, my telly is a custom shop and oh, I got a really good deal on used. Mm -hmm. It's just sitting in guitar center. That blue, that's was, that blue one, right? Yeah. It's uh, I forget the name of it. But, you know, they only do like a fairly small run of those. Right. And the story was when I bought it that an actor has this really nasty habit of buying expensive guitars <laughs> and then constantly unloading them. Yeah. Probably can barely play. Right. And yeah. it's probably, you know. Those are good for guys like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably like a 4500 to $5,000 guitar that mm -hmm. I got for about half that price. Did you buy it on, on uh, Reverb or eBay or something? At, at Guitar Center. Oh, right. It was just okay. hanging there in the used section. Oh, good. It's like I tried it out, and immediately it was like, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> the neck feels beautiful. It, it, the whole guitar probably weighs about six pounds. Oh, my gosh. Super great. light. You yeah. know? I got my first custom shop uh, similarly at Guitar Center. Um, for reasons I don't need to go into now, I was without a guitar at all. And I went to um, Guitar Center to, to look around and I found a, a very nice, simple, early looking Telecaster. And it turned out it was one of those, it was a 1996 or seven Cunetto Nocaster. Okay. I don't know if you know the lore, but that was the first of the the uh, custom shop relic no casters mm -hmm. and uh, the predecessor to say to the to this one and um <clears throat> i i just happened to i think they wanted like 1200 bucks for it or maybe less and i picked it up and and it was really really good the only yeah, thing i yeah. didn't like about it is the neck wasn't really very stable 
And so it would move around a lot. And I let that guitar go, but I've since replaced it with a, another one from the same era because I had, you know, nostalgic feelings. <laughs> right, yeah. And I, yeah. I really like mine because of the uh, both the bridge and the neck pickup, which is basically like a, a Gretsch Filtertron type of pickup. Oh, you got those kind. Okay, yeah. It, it really blends really well. Uh, right, the, right. And the, the bridge pickup is like how you want a bridge pickup telly to sound like it's not super super bitey it's got some meat to it yeah you know those filter yeah. trap pickups they have a special sound because there's so much metal in the casing they kind of sound topped off like they're bright and ringy but they're not spiky well that's the 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 uh neck pickup but i'm talking about the bridge pickup is is like a telly pickup oh okay cool yeah yeah oh, it's actually it's not, it, it, you didn't get two filter trons. It's just, no, no, a, no, no. Okay. Yeah. But it's a probably a really a bit stronger tele pickup because it's got to match up with that filter tron in the neck, right? It could be, yeah. That might be a little bit could stronger. Be. Yeah. Which I don't mind. Yeah. I, I, know. I, like... I, I like the no caster, uh, this, this, you know, the broadcaster or no caster style flat pull, strong output telecaster pickup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It Same here. Suits me. Yeah. So on to my next gear question. Yep. Uh, what is your all-time favorite amp, even if it might not be practical to use on a gig every time? Right. Oh, uh, well, oddly, you might be surprised by this. I really like Fender amplifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a number of Fender amplifiers. My kind of go-to is a, is a deluxe reverb, but but um, they're, they're – I, I, you know, they're not always, they don't always work. <laughs> the reverb tank breaks on the way to the gig. And, you know, right. the tubes are, tubes are hard these days because it used to be like, I've got amplifiers with the original tubes in them. Still. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they just don't but make that, tubes like they used to. No, no, they don't. And I, I mean, I've got, I've, I've got a, a Viberlux reverb with almost all the original tubes. There might've been one that got changed and it sounds so much better than anything I've got that has newer tubes in it. The tubes just, they're okay. They're right away. And then they just get not so good sounding. They're unpredictable. They're not reliable. So it's hard for me. I have, I mean, right within reach of where I'm sitting, I have a, a Princeton Reverb, a Blues Junior, and a Vibro Champ Reverb amp that I just bought. It's a little <laughs> tiny five watt vibro champ with a digital reverb built into it it's a new product from fender and it's you know it's a light little thing and just for sitting down and teaching and all that i thought it would be really nice but even without the volume there's a little hum you know and so i think ah oh, it sounds great but then there's that little hum you know <laughs> so i use sometimes uh you know quilters or henriksen amplifiers because they get the job done and they don't break and they sound consistent from one day to the next but I really like, like a Fender Deluxe Reverb is a really beautiful thing. It really is. And I have a nice old one that, man, you turn that thing. If you just turn that thing almost all the way up for a certain sound, it sounds great on the low end, you know, the lower mm -hmm. volume end yep. as well. But, man, you, I don't think I've ever gotten a sound as good as that amp turned almost all the way up. Um, you just turn your pickup down on your guitar. Yeah, and there's just something sweet about that when those six yeah. V six tubes are cooking, right? Yeah, and I mean you can you can try to get a pedal that would do something like it, and you can't. Uh, maybe put a boost pedal in front of that and have a good like a clean boost in front of the of the of a you know maxed out deluxe reverb might be a, a good way to go. But I mean that's for that you know guitar strangler kind of that's right. the other side of my personality is you know i don't do it as much anymore because i'm starting to go deaf and i don't want to i don't want to lose anymore but you know a telecaster into a deluxe reverb turned all the way up it's a great sound cool <laughs> really well that's one. that's a significant enough answer for me <laughs> um uh, speaking of fender amps i at least i hope i still will be able to get it i have waiting for me in canada <coughs> The, the very first amp that I ever played through on those gigs when I was 12 years old. Oh, my God, really? It, it was like just like back in the day when everybody would plug into the same amp. Yeah, right. A 67 Fender Bassman. Oh, my God. So yep. 
the the guy that I used to play with is, uh, passed away like eight years ago or something like that. And I just thought, well, th that amp's not kicking around anymore. I heard his wife was moving. So I decided just to give her a call one day and she goes, oh, I'll just give it to you. <laughs> cool. So man. it's sitting it, in Canada. Was it a, black, a black face piggyback? Yeah. 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 Great. Those I, are really, really good. Those are really good. In fact, people were asleep on those for a while. Now they're not anymore. But th that and the Bandmaster are, were just fantastic amps. Yeah. You know. And it, I bet you any money, it still has the original tubes in it, probably yeah. from 1967. <laughs> yeah, it, it might need some uh, TLC, but... Uh, yeah, make sure when you turn it on, you do it. You put it on a variac, or you bring it to somebody who knows what they're doing, so well, they can that, bring it up slow. Or you that's what to... I'm going to do. I'm going to bring it into a guy that I take my amps to here in New York. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, smaller gigs, I use a PV Classic 30 that I like. Oh, those are great amplifiers. Yeah. Ted loved those too. I had a. I went through a PV phase. I wanted something bulletproof and and you know clean and and you know that's I got a couple of different pvs but yeah they're those are good those are good and then when i go on tour i take uh my port city pearl it's like a 50 watt I know, totally I know. clean amp. I, was, yeah. I was happy to hear you because i i'm I, I got in touch with the guy daniel is that his name yeah daniel's great a great guy yeah and and yeah. Uh, he, i have one of his cabinets i have a uh the the wave cabinet with an ev in it and i used it for years with a with a fuchs okay I, it was my sort of my big you know, modern dumbly kind of rig. Yeah. Um, and uh, I tried, he was going to build me an amplifier and I tried to get him to build me like a, a fender type amplifier with reverb and he just didn't want to do it. Or he, at that time he wasn't ha comfortable doing it. I think he's done it since, but, but so, you know, but I, I mean, he was a nice guy. I'm glad to see he's still doing stuff. Yeah. Know? Well, how I first heard of it is, is when I went to go see Kurt Rosenwinkel play, he's got this amp that, looked very unique and different and it sounded great and i had to look, do some research and look it up i went up to the stage on a break and i'm looking i'm looking to see what is it port city okay i'll i'll you know so then i contacted him and then, yeah and i also went to go see another player in town play with play at a combo version and it sounded so good i was like that's it i'm i'm gonna get one yeah, that's great. That's great. A lot of the a lot of the combo amps that I've heard lately that are being made by, you know, on the Fender sort of side of the platform, they sound like Fenders and they're either well done or not. But a lot of the ones that are more sort of on the Dumble side of the platform, you know, like a uh, the chassis is that you know eleven inch deep one and it's basically a square. Sometimes they don't end up translating in a way that I like. There's not mm -hmm. enough bloom or something and and I, there may be longer throw amplifiers but um i i know what you mean i i think his amps sound really good yeah i was thinking it, about it, getting one again uh, you know getting back in touch with him and i realized i looked around and i realized you know tim you don't need another amplifier <laughs> <laughs> but you're not a loud one you know yeah well when you're because i do trio gigs that's m m mainly my thing uh-huh when you're playing with a drummer and a bass player and you're able to crank that Port City Pearl up, it just gets this really fat, juicy, warm tone. And and I'm a, a big believer in really cranking the mids up. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I don't know, it just there's just something really juicy about it that you don't I, uh, need I, uh, any overdrive or anything. I used a Fuchs and I didn't like the overdrive channel, but I loved the clean channel. And I would just, you know, for overdrive sounds, I would just yeah. put a Zen drive or something like that in front of it. And, um, but I love that rich, that rich, clean st stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, well, since we're talking about tone, uh, as far as amp goes, did you consciously work on getting good tone? Or is it something that developed over time naturally? I got to tell you, you know, if, if if the recordings I've made are any evidence, I always cared about sound, but I didn't know about amplifiers. I didn't understand. So I had a lot of bad amplifiers in my time, you know, things that I just would, although I lucked out, I got a Music Man RD-112 with an EV in it. And that, mm -hmm. 
I, I took that on the on the road. I, it was my first real professional um, amplifier, and I used it for many years. And it it gave you a kind of a good sound, a clean sound. It was a great clean sound. The overdrive was horrible, but the clean sound was very very nice. And so it kind of by accident, I the amplifier component, which is only one aspect of sound, was together you know um and then yeah so what i meant i was kind of segueing from amps to like yeah, fingers right. guitar getting tone right, yeah. right yeah and i was going there too and so but i didn't always have good gear but as soon as i started to realize what the the gear component was that would allow me to get what i was you know imagining so I had this theory. I kind of got known, uh, you know, in the in the early YouTube days as kind of a tone guy, and and people would sometimes even write me a note and say, "Hey, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. Hey, by the way, would you give me a lesson about if I get, you know, could you help me get my rig together, you know?" And um, I I started thinking, well, how do you teach somebody about that? And so I I just I devised this thing that I kind of did, which was. Okay, I'll be, I'll get together and talk to you about gear. But for two weeks, I want you to every day for about an hour, uh, every uh, imagine the perfect sound in your mind. Don't touch a guitar, and the perfect sound may be similar to a sound you've heard before, but it's not. We're not saying I'm not saying go and find a record that has the sound that you're looking for. I'm saying actually imagine that sound in your mind, every aspect of it how the strings feel under your fingers, how the sound hits your ears, the way it fills the room, is there a reflection or not, is there, is it dark, bright, or whatever, just everything about it. And it's just really, really imagine the perfect sound. Then, after you can conjure up what you imagine is the perfect sound in your mind, then I'll teach you how to get that sound out of an amplifier. Right. Or a guitar and amplifier. Because that's eighty percent of the battle, right there. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. And and the truth is, and I I had I tried this once. I had I was teaching a class, and this was particular class was a blues class, and you know the the school that I was at had these little horrible amplifiers, and like all like most schools do, they have these little horrible amplifiers that yep. some company donated or whatever. Um, so I told one day people kept asking me about tone, tone, tone. I said, okay, next week, everybody bring your amp in. And I will, I will show you how to get my sound out of every amplifier you bring in. I don't care what it is. <laughs> I, I was, it was quite a bit of hubris on my part, right? right. <laughs> but it was interesting to see that once you figure, once you hear it in your mind, and then you can have a little bit of an understanding of what the knobs on the amplifier actually do, particularly the EQ knobs and whatever kind of gain um, relationship there is. You know, you can get the sound you're after within reason, you know? Yeah. Um, and also having been on the road for many, many years where um, the amplifier was whatever was there when you got there. Uh, you have to do all sorts of stuff. You have to, first of all, you have to say, well, how am I going to get this silver face twin with with only one good power tube <laughs> to work? <laughs> you know, right. and how am I going to get it to sound decent? And what's the tone recipe with, for an amplifier that acts like that? Um, so it's some, you know, a combination of survival. I really believe, though, that the, the, the sound we imagine is the sound that we eventually can get rather than searching for it outside of ourselves and, and then liking it or whatever. Right. Well, like many other things, I'm, I'm guessing we are agreement on that because I think the same way. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I know for a fact that I didn't like bright sounds. And I was always dialing a sound in that I liked. It was pleasing to my ear. Even when I, I started off playing a, a nylon classical guitar as well. And I used to remember like putting my head down to it and just listening to it yeah. as I'm playing, like just falling in love with the, that sound. 
You know? And if you're 12 years old and you're playing uh, in a band and you get to play through a, a 67 basement head, you're going to get, it's that, that's going to influence you right there. Just the, the size of the note that that amplifier is willing to give you. And the, the saturation, especially when, you know, maybe one or two other guys are plugged into it and it's working a little harder, you know. And they turn their volume down and your volume goes down. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever combination of stuff. But mm -hmm. that's that's a you know, you, you got lucky or or you're fortunate that that was the the amp rather than, you know, a Yamaha solid state amp or a crate or something like Which that. Which I had a Yamaha solid state. I did too. Um, <laughs> uh and I even had a nice little tube amp that I still wish I had, uh, a trainer amp. Made. I bought a trainer. My first tube amp I bought, and it was a Canadian company, and they I bought it in, through the mail. It was like a twin, twin reverb type amp, but it had a master volume, so I could get, mm -hmm. I could get uh, the blues breakers tone on it. All right, <laughs> cool. Uh, and it was probably like a maybe thirty watt amp or something like that, thirty thirty five watt amp. Perfect. But and and I I remember being able to dial in a tone that I liked. Yeah. You know, I would sit there and and yeah. that that became a, a gigging amp as well. Yeah, I mean the first time you the first time you manage oop, easily by accident, the first time you manage to get a sound that you dig, um then that makes a big impact, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. And um let's see. Uh you know, I just I went through a whole bunch of different amplifiers and, and then I, I even had a, like a, a high watt, a hundred, hundred watt, um, beast <laughs> that I used to play on those country gigs. I would take just the head mm -hmm. and I would put it through the Yamaha cabinet. I would just take, unhook the speakers and then plug it into the back of the high watt. And it yeah. was a great tone actually clean. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Other than tone secrets or stuff, what are your favorite guitarists on the scene right now? Maybe, maybe one oh, or two. Uh, yeah, I have a few. I have a lot of, you know, young guys who might even be students of mine who I'm quite fond of. And, and I get a charge out of hearing them, you know, coming, coming along. There's a guy named uh, Jacob Peck that I think is very interesting and, and you know, unique and musical. Um, uh, in another category, young people who are younger players who are just phenomenal. Um uh, my favorite these days is Julian Lodge. I just love him as a person. He's a friend of mine, and I love his playing. Anytime he does anything, I watch it or listen to it or support it. Um, and uh, he's a genuinely wonderful person and a beautiful player. And I never, I don't think there's a way to have those two things not influencing each other. You right. know? Um, yeah. I'm not a big fan of a lot of the more mathy players that I'm hearing. Um, but uh, there's a, a young man named Donnie Bell who lives in Pittsburgh. And Donnie is kind of a Danny Gatton style player. Okay. He plays mostly country music, although he's got the biggest ears I've ever seen. And he plays a Telecaster with a pick and fingers and he can play sort of Scotty Anderson style. Do you mm -hmm. know who Scotty yep. Anderson is? Yeah, he, he's I, probably the closest I've ever heard anybody kind of cop into that stuff. And then the, the Danny Gatton thing. And then also, um, you know, he's like I said, he's trying to learn standards now. And he, we got together and um, and talked about that and uh, recently sent me a note saying, hey, what would you do on this tune? And I sort of made a little video and sent it to him. And so he's learning. He's continuing to learn young man, but he's very, very good. Um you know, there's a lot of guys who I don't even know their names, but but I'm touched by how good they are. Um, and, you know, and a lot of them are emulating me, which is, you know, kind of also touching and a little overwhelming to see somebody on Instagram play one of my arrangements, probably better than I could play it. Yeah, and then there's contemporaries of mine who I really admire and love. I like Lauren Lofsky very much. I know Lauren. Yeah, I, mean, I took lessons with Lauren. John Stoll is also a beautiful player who I really enjoy. Um, our mutual friend John Knowles always touches me. You know, I, I can get kind of uh, 
a little obsessed with moving voices and all this sort of stuff and the cramming a lot of things in and John plays so beautifully and so simply and so elegantly. I, I listen to him and I say, Oh, right. Uh, I was far as saying, Oh, <laughs> you're more like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but Hey, you, you just play what you hear in your head. You, you yeah, can't... I know. I know the, the, the compare and contrast game doesn't li I don't lose sleep about it overnight, but, yeah. but um, every once in a while I'll hear somebody like John and I'll, it'll just remind me of something that I might've, distance myself from or lost touch uh, with, uh, with because of, uh, you know, some sort of train of mind that I was on and, and, and just remember that to always go for beauty. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? um, I'm trying to think it, this is a hard question for me. Uh, you know, I have pals. I like Josh Smith very much. I love the way he plays. Um, there's a guy named Chris Buck who, who's playing oh, in trees. Yeah, he's got a nice touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an Instagram kind of guy. I love Derek Trucks. I mean, and I'll, you know, it's funny, Derek. If you, I, I really resisted being on Instagram, but I kind of succumbed, and so now I, I have mostly guitar-oriented people who are following me. You know. Anyway, so I, I notice a lot of people sort of really wanting to be like Derek Trucks. And some of them are very, very good. A lot of them are very, very good. How could you, you know, I mean, the guys who get good are musical and then they have that as a, um, a kind of high water mark. I think that's really beautiful because it's, it's melodic. You know, he puts an emphasis on, Derek puts an emphasis on the beauty of a melody. So right. if he's influencing younger cats to play that way, I'm happy about that, you know. I, uh, I, I really like uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel a lot. I, you know, I have listened to him and I, and I don't, I haven't listened to maybe enough, so I'm not very, I'm not as familiar with his playing. I'm not as into what he's doing lately, but early 2000s and whatever, that was sort of my favorite period of his. Uh, I would recommend getting um, Next Step, I think is the name of the album. Yeah. And he made a standards record, didn't he? He did, yeah, I think. I always like to hear somebody's standards record because I think you find out really where they're... For, for me, it's more relatable because I don't have to get over not knowing the tune. I can hear what they have to say on a tune that I might know, you know. Right. He's, he's got a couple of standard albums, like one way early on called Into It. Yeah. Like, uh, as in intuition, Into It. Can you talk a little bit about Jamie Finley? I heard a yeah, duo. Yeah. I heard a duo of you guys playing "Gentle Rain," and I thought it was really beautiful. Oh, thank you. And um, you, you guys, you know, you both play together really, really well. And that's one of the things that I find the hardest is playing with another guitar player because I always feel sonically that we're stepping on each other's toes, and it's hard to for well, it to breathe. Yeah, I know what you mean. You can't really do if you're a solo guitar player, and if you've developed a lot of cool sounds and stuff uh it's it's not likely that you'll be able to use all of that stuff in a duo you know so there has to be a willingness to pare things down to to sort of half <laughs> of what yeah. you might normally do. so yeah jamie is uh, and jamie the story about me and jamie is kind of interesting and i'm happy to tell it because i just talked to him on the phone a couple of days ago and we're really excited about getting you know we're both vaccinated now and jamie and i were orbiting around each other for many, many years. Like I went to GIT and then I taught at GIT for a couple of years in the summers. And then I moved to Seattle. Well, Jamie grew up in Seattle, went down to GIT and taught there for many years because he was, you know, uh, influenced. He was, a, you know, uh, a student, I think, of Don Mock and maybe even Howard. And then he goes down there, lived in L.A., you know, did things down there, wrote books, made records, did all sorts of great things. Then he came back up here and I had gone away and then I came back up here. <laughs> and so suddenly our, we were orbiting and our orbits kind of went like that and they kind of came together. So it, I remember what happened. I posted something on Facebook um, and I was ha happened to be playing a duet with myself on a song, East of the Sun. And I so and I just just me, you know, walking a bass line and then improvising over the top of that. And Jamie just wrote me a note and said, hey, man, I hear you're around here. And I said, yeah, I'm around here. I hear you're around here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we ought to get together and play. And of course, that's the thing you always want to hear. right? So 
we got together at my studio where I was teaching, about halfway between where he lives and where I now live. And um, I swear to you, man, the first... We played All the Things You Are. And in fact, we didn't talk about it. We said, hi, how you doing? Guitar. Two guys that maybe didn't know what to say, so we just started playing. And we played that song, and it was like the Vulcan mind meld or something. Hmm. That's um, what it sounds like, yeah. It, it, we, there's, there was enough common material in our backgrounds, you know. Um, I swear he would read my thoughts, and I could do it to him. We, You know, we play gigs where we don't talk about the repertoire. We, we just... One guy will start and the next guy will join in. And if you don't, the rule is, whose turn is it to start? And and if I don't know the song, it's a solo guitar piece. And if I do know, I'll follow him. And if I and, and vice versa, I'll start mm-hmm. something. He'll jump in. And then we got to the point where we were saying, oh well, let's let's you know pick a few tunes so we're not you know we don't have to have rely on having a a brilliant night you know. Right. And we did we. We picked some tunes that we that we just made a list of st- stuff we both knew, so we wouldn't hang each other out to dry or whatever. And we'd get together and to rehearse, but it would just be us playing. You know, we yeah. maybe never even play those tunes again. You know, but there is really something. We're different enough so that there's variety in the sound. Mm-hmm. He plays a either a nylon string or a flat top steel string, with his fingers and nails. And he's got beautiful technique. He's got beautiful harmonic understanding. And the most important thing is we share about more closely than anybody I've ever played with before. We share a time feel. Right. Yeah, that's what I I really caught on was that you guys were like locked in. Yeah. But it still breathed really nice. Like yeah. Right. And, and that's part of the time feel that we share. You know, both of us have played in R&B bands and lots of lots of time on on the stand with drummers, but we've also both played solo guitar a lot and in a lot of duets. Because when you're a guitar teacher, you play a lot of duets, <laughs> as you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just it, it it was immediate. And 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 the other thing about it was, have you ever played with somebody and you felt, oh my God, this is wonderful, and then and you they aren't really that <laughs> enthusiastic, <laughs> and it's like. That's yeah. Happened, right? yeah, that has happened. Yeah. And this the- was like immediately we're like, you know, reaching in our pockets, looking for the wedding ring to propose to the <laughs> other guy. You know? Right. Uh, it was remarkable. And I wish we had more of a chance to play. I wish we could, you know, tour and do things. Neither of us are very ambitious when it comes to that. Um, in terms of like the business side. <laughs> so he plays a lot of sideman gigs. I play a lot of, you know, I'm in a band, so I'm, you know, I go where they tell me to go, you know, right. uh, which is a relief in some way. But then it's also kind of a tender trap in ways, too, because then I, you know, you're not out expressing your own name on the scene. So you kind of disappear. Oh, yeah, where's Tim? I don't know. He's in that band. Oh, no, he don't call him. Calls, you know, right. so but Jamie and I love playing with each other and we've documented our playing in a couple of those videos, there's four videos that were shot professionally. Then we had uh, another gig that we fi- that was filmed on a iPhone or something, and then we married better audio with the video. Um, and uh, we're determined to try and do something. We're going to make a record. Um, that soon. would be good. Yeah, that would be. And good. you know, his his um, he likes a slightly more, maybe a little like another. Another era forward, like he's more, he likes Chick Corea and, and a little bit more, you know, things like that. And I kind of like just nice old songs, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think that we put, if we can figure out a way to put all that together so that, that neither of us are sweating too much, you know, um, I, I probably have to step up a little bit more and learn more of the material that he wants because he can play almost anything I would want him to play. Right. You know, um, and uh, but I love I love playing with Jamie and and um, the sweetest guy friend. You know, mm-hmm. I trust him. I don't have to worry about him. You know, getting a gig and paying me half as much as he's me. You know that kind of yeah. shit that yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you run into sometimes. Mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. like him, and uh, you know, uh, 
to the extent that we can play together, you know, neither of us are spring chickens. And so, you know, driving for three hours to get to the other guy's house isn't so fun. But um, we're, we're determined to try and play together. It's, it, it's a rare thing. You know, you, I play with hundreds of guitar players in my life. And mm, probably 90% of them were not the most pleasant experiences because we do it a lot, but a lot of times it leaves to my musical sensibilities, it leaves something to be desired. Yeah, and yeah. Jamie just fit, we fit like two peas in a pod. And, and I think that's important to recognize, you know? Yeah. No, you I know, John Stoll and I have a similar thing. It's very different. Mm-hmm. It's very different, but it also has this similar time feel, uh, an agreement about the time feel. And, you know, John is so unique. I feel like just just being able to play with him is, is a special treat. And the music comes out sounding different. It's much more, um, uh, it's not as, as explicit, you know, and it's not as tune-based. It's more open. Ethereal? <laughs> yeah, ethereal maybe, yeah. His I, playing. I don't too. know what the right word is, but. Right, I know, but, you know, I and I, well, playing with John, we're so different. I think I balance him out. I like I add earth to his sky, mm. you know, and I mm-hmm. think that's a really neat thing. And that's what people have com- commented on. With Jamie and I, it's like we're both earth and sky at the same time. And it becomes, you know, it just a, a, a melding of, I mean, and people have said it too. It's like we're both sitting there with our eyes closed and we're literally reading each other's minds. And it is really wonderful. It goes on there. It goes off the rail sometimes too. We're yeah. not geniuses, but but it's a wonderful feeling to just feel like I can just com- I'm completely safe when I play with Jamie. You know? the, the, I think the only time that I've ever played duo with someone like that was with a bass player, mm. and that was Don Don Thompson playing bass. Oh my God! Of course, of course, yeah. he would make you feel that way. Oh, like it just felt like everything I played. He just made me sound better. <laughs> yeah, right. Like it was you, so much yeah, fun. I think, yeah. I, the word I feel say is safe. Mm-hmm. I feel like I can do anything and it'll be okay. And I'm feeling like listened to. I'm feeling encouraged. And I'm feeling like I can do the same. I'm allowed to do the same for someone else. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could find a bass player that gave me that feeling. Um, that, you know, similar to, the, what, to what I have with Jamie. Because a lot of my conception is... Uh, to be honest, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to just play with Jamie all the time because half of what I do would sort of not be as useful. Right. Right. And same with him. Right. Because we're both trio guitar players and solo guitar players as well. So having a, a bass player who I felt like I could do the same type of thing with would be also be really wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah. I think that if I'm going to do a duo gig, I I almost would rather have for sure a bass player yeah 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 it's hard to find a good one though it's you know don thompson is is don thompson for a reason you know (laughs) yeah yeah there's not a lot of don thompson's out there in the world (laughs) no i had the same conversation with uh john abercrombie about don thompson too Mm. and he he is in agreement is don still active uh he took some time off i haven't really talked to him a whole lot or anything like that other than an odd email maybe once a year or something but i know he was taking care of his wife she was quite oh. ill and then she passed away mm-hmm. so now he's getting getting back into the scene okay. that yeah. sometimes happens yeah. so it was it wasn't like an ed bicker thing where he just decided he was going to retire and right. didn't touch guitar yeah and i have a funny ed bickert story oh good because uh being living living in toronto for 20 years uh there's a famous club in 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 uh, toronto called the rex hotel that everybody plays at uh-huh. did you ever play there at all or rex the rex hotel rex yeah rex so yeah. I, I i've never been in toronto i hope to oh be. okay so it they put on a a yearly bash where just musicians that play there are invited and the public isn't oh okay and uh one night ed bickert was there uh-huh. And I got up and played, and I don't think I knew he was there. <laughs> so, so when I when I got down, I was talking to him a little bit, and uh, I was telling him like, "Oh, I'm like changing my whole thing. Like I'm doing more like of a Lenny thing." He's like, "Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, just looking at me." 
<laughs> and he goes, I like most of what you played. <laughs> <laughs> But he, other yeah, people, so he really was as uh, as unanimated as as we're led to believe. Well, a very dry sense of humor too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love Ed, man. I mean, there, there. I, I, I tell the story a lot when I'm trying to convince my students not to play so jittery and and chicka chicka and not to comp with every chord they know, you know, in the absence of any kind of melodic con you know melodic continuity or whatever i said i was <laughs> i was listening to, to to paul desmond and ed bickert's playing with him i don't remember the tune and i'm listening and i'm just transfixed and all of a sudden i realize paul stopped playing and it's it's ed's solo but he for eight bars or or even 16 bars he just kept comping like he had been prior you know what i mean mm -hmm. And it's it was like this light bulb awakening moment where, I mean, what he was doing was so interesting and so transfixing. Well, why wouldn't it be good enough to stand on its own when it came his time to solo, <laughs> right. right? And and uh, I just love that about his playing, how he was so willing. I mean, here's the thing, man. Everybody loves Ed Bickert. I don't think there's a guitar player out there. I've heard some people say oh, we, they don't like his sound, but I, which I can't quite believe. But I think they don't like this. I don't. I think they don't like that what they see in his hands more, which they're they're, they're seeing with their ear. Or they're, yeah, they're right. Hearing with their eyes. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, there you know there are dedicated arch toppers who just can't fathom that he played a Telecaster. But anyway. Everybody wants to sound like Ed Pickard, and nobody's willing to play as little as he did. On you know, I mean, he could blow, he could play, he had chops, but the restraint is is, is next to impossible. You know what I mean? It's really it's funny. We all talk how great he is, and then we all play about twice as much. As well, he does. what I hear when I hear Ed Bickard is just clarity. Yes. Like he is playing exactly what he's hearing in his head. Yeah. And it's, and it's, there's a sense of, a, of generosity and, and support there that you, it's rare, you know, that's why yeah. people love playing with him. Have you heard the story about Ed's um, on a gig and with, uh, I think the, the leader was Warren Vache, an American trumpet player. And he came up to Toronto to play a gig and, the story is being told by the bass player on the gig, so you know it wasn't made okay. up. Or whatever. And the bass player is telling this story that he's on the gig with Ed and a drummer and Warren Vache. And Warren plays old songs. That's one of the, he's an older style yeah. player. And um, this bass player says that Warren called a tune, and, and oddly, Ed, who's known as a guy who knows every song, demurred. He said, I don't know that song. Sorry. So they didn't play it. Then on the break, the bass player said that he happened, he didn't understand exactly why, but he happened to, to know that song. So he jotted the changes down for Ed on a napkin for the next set. And then, so Warren Vache calls the tune again, and they play it. Comes time for soloing, and as was the usual, Warren finishes his solo, turns to Ed, and Ed nods his head and says, says, tells the bass player, you take it. And the bass player takes the solo, and they finish up the tune. And uh, the bass player goes up to Ed afterwards. He says, Ed, I got to ask you something, man. You were playing so beautifully on that tune. Oh, my God, it was just wonderful. Why didn't you want a solo on it? And Ed said, I didn't know the song. Right. Literally, that's the only that was the beginning, the middle, and the end of it. I'm not going to improvise on that chord progression. I didn't know the song, right, and I right. thought that's a wonderful, wonderful kind of uh, attitude, you know. Yeah, because he probably would have known the lyrics to songs and yeah, hundreds and know, hundreds. Of yeah, them. exactly. Well, I think Ed Bickert was more like in the thousand to fifteen hundred range of songs probably yeah, that he knew yeah, yeah and a big influence on him was the stan kenton orchestra supposedly yeah he, that's where he heard some of his harmonies yeah yeah so he's basically trying to do stan kenton on guitar 
Yeah. But just in a <laughs> more subdued way, I guess. Yeah, right. I don't know. It, you know, that's his story anyway. We don't really even know if he understands exactly the whole story, which is, you know, because uh, none of us are self-aware enough to know exactly what's going on when we play. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. I just know that I loved it and I loved the trios and I loved, you know, the quartets. And I didn't like him as well when he sort of there, he made some records with a piano player and it, they were good records, but I didn't hear him doing the thing I loved so much is the thing I loved that, about Ed. I mean, he, he comps beautifully and let's say we're saying, we're, you know, we, we're hearing something like, uh, that kind of feeling behind a soloist, right? What I really love is when he goes, you know, those little beautiful, softly played chord punctuations, two notes usually. Yeah. That for me, I love so much. And when a piano player is there, he doesn't do that. And and so then he becomes more like a Barney Kessel style player, and that part of his personality is, is you know, comes to the fore. So right. I really love you know the the trio and quartet without a piano side of Ed Bickert. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think I I'm following the same suit as you as far as that's concerned. Uh, and he, and Ed's been an influence on me too. It's kind of hard when you were living in Toronto. Right. I mean, and Ed Bickert has influenced the whole. Yeah, it looms large there, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like between him and, and um, uh, Lauren Lofsky, you know. Yeah. Uh, and Lauren is definitely an Ed guy, too. Oh, sure. He comes from that. And then yeah. even, you know, right. kind of mixed a, a little bit of Lenny and especially uh, uh, Bill Evans. Right. Right. You know, yeah, there's I a love, lot yeah. of Bill Evans in, in Lauren's playing. Did you ever get to take a lesson from Ed, or did he ever teach? No, I don't think he ever taught. Ever. <laughs> um, Wasn't interested in it. The only person that he, that might have learned from him and was just on gigs was Lauren Lofsky. Yeah. I know that one record that they made. Um, Lauren's first record on Pablo, that one that that Oscar Peterson, you know, produced or got him. That record was a revelation for me because it's the only other guy I'd ever heard who played like Ed with, with chordal, you know, sustained chordal um, accompaniment like a piano player might play. And I really, I'd like, I'd like to find a copy of that record again because I don't even know if it's still in print or whatever, but I really remember liking that record at mm. a point. I don't think I ever heard it. Oh, the first yeah. Lauren Lofsky record. No, never heard it. His tone, yeah, I think he was playing a Les Paul and his tone was absolutely perfect. It's a trio record. I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 if I find it, if it's on YouTube or if I can find, I'll, I'll, um, I'll send you a note. Maybe sure. I'll send him a note too. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me see here. Any hobbies or something that you do outside of music that people might find interesting? Hmm. It's not a hobby. Um, I don't really have hobbies. I, I try every once in a while thinking what my life would be. <laughs> I have to laugh at that because I'm kind of the same way. Like, you know, there, I mean, what's I, a hobby? I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't need a hobby because, like, a, for me, in some ways, a hobby is the thing that you do which gives you joy um, after you've done all the things that you have to do. Right. And I get to do this all the time, and, and I don't need a release from this, you know, or – Whatever. So that's my that's the story I tell myself anyway. Um, although I have gone fishing a couple of times and that's fun. Um, cool. But uh, I'm a meditator, mm -hmm. and I have I've been very interested in and sort of active in in um, meditation. And I'm a meditation teacher, so I have some teaching responsibilities. Um, so that's a different part, you know. Uh, uh, lately, with with the qu quarantine, I'm teaching more because. I don't have to leave the house. I can do it online. Whereas before I would, you know, if I were going to lead a retreat, for instance, usually there are weekends, three days on the weekend or something like that. And of course, that's when I make my living and I couldn't do as much traveling to, to, to teach that. Um, but of course, then there's also my own sort of personal um, meditative life, which 
uh, you know, really beautifully is integrated to my musical life as well. I don't really see the two things as being separate. How, how uh, long each day do you meditate? And is it more than once per day? Um, well, in some ways it's constant, <laughs> you know, in that, that the, uh, the, um, the, what I, what I may or may not do for a half an hour or an hour in the morning. Um, I, I used to be very, very, you know, I'd live in a meditation center and every morning get up and practice and every evening you practice and all this kind of stuff. So I was very intense about it. In fact, I stopped playing for quite a few years and, and pursued that exclusively and, you know, uh, helped other people to do it as well. Um, so these days it's more about uh, a meditation in action or the sort of the, the, the fruit of what you hope a, li a life of sitting on a cushion and, and uh, counting your breath or whatever it might be, whatever method uh, would lead to, which is a life of, of uh, that is imbued with a meditative um, sort of uh, investigation of your moment to moment life rather than separating it out so this is something i do over there and then i go about that mm -hmm. um uh but i i will you know I, I, the formal meditation practice where you if you walked in the room and i was meditating you'd say oh look a dude is meditating uh you know that that's you know something like you know a half an hour to, to an hour every day um usually in the morning um but for me uh lately especially i'm i'm not as it's not as important important for me to do it every day as a separate activity it's kind of become more in, a part of my being so i can you know one of the things i like to do is right be, between uh, if i teach five students in a row um between the students i'll just just sit and center myself and check my breath so I don't bring anything from student A into student B's world because right. you know, student B uh, deserves my full attention. You know, those kinds of things um, are important to me. And of course, when I play, I often try and find you know a, a quiet place to sort of become centered and let go of any kind of of um, you know cacophony. <laughs> Right, it might be going on from whatever, getting to the gig or whatever. Um, so I try and incorporate what I learned from being a longtime meditator into all moments of my life. So if I if I'm getting upset or or getting nervous or or bored or any of those kinds of things throughout the course of my everyday life, I I have this sort of voice of reason that reminds me that. You know, everything is worthwhile, you know, <laughs> <laughs> nothing is ever as bad as it seems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, I've, I've dabbled a little bit with it in the past, mm -hmm. but for me, sometimes my meditation is just playing guitar. That's true, too. I, especially I, especially during the pandemic, where I, I'm I'm so busy. I don't even really get to practice anywhere near like I used to. So hmm. that 15 minutes of focus, just yeah. thing, whatever I'm planning on doing is just playing through a song or something is, yeah. is, is like my meditation or kind of a, not, not a, a strict, anything strict or formal or anything like that. But I just love laying in a warm tub of hot water and just relax. And that's it, kind yeah. of my meditation. Uh, bath. I call this yeah. bathtub Zen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> Anyway, that's that's me. I don't like you know. Just the original question about hobbies is I'm kind of a one track guy, you know. Always yeah. happen. Yeah, same here. I mean, between you know, uh, right now teaching and working on my YouTube channel, uh, that's kind of like it. Good. How's life in Brooklyn, man? What do you what do you like about it, and what drives you crazy about it? Um, what? Well, I just moved in October. To to Brooklyn or to a new place? A different in place in Brooklyn, yeah. And uh, the rent is cheaper and like twenty five percent cheaper, and the place well, is twenty five percent for... bigger. You live in a in a couple of bedroom apartment or something, or what do you? It's got? It's, it's a one bedroom apartment with my girlfriend, but 
I kind of took over the living room as my. So we're in the living room now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, couch and TV are off to the, Oh, okay. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty big place for, for New York, like, you know, pre-war building, mm-hmm. big, thick walls, not like okay. a newer well, you building. Don't have, you don't really hear your neighbors too much or no, not too much. No. Shooting videos when the water's running or something like that is sometimes troublesome. <laughs> the, the only thing is the people that live below us have a home theater system. And they like to crank that thing sometimes oh, yeah. right yeah. when I'm going to like start rumbling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, or playing video games or something. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, other than other than that, I, I like Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. I missed living in Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan for a while, for about four years. You become a New Yorker, man. Yeah, because it was uh, it was nice just being able to walk everywhere. You know, so in I Brooklyn, would, you're, you're not as it's not as walkable. No, no. I mean, all my gigs usually were in Manhattan. Okay. Uh, very rarely did I ever play in Brooklyn. Um, and I, I would got lost in I got lost in Brooklyn once, or what I guess was Brooklyn. And my memory of it was the roads were very narrow, and the buildings were like these, you know older old style you know uh apartment buildings or home homes that were then turned into apartments uh i wished and i liked it i've got a good feeling from it but i i had to find my way to queens and i <laughs> i wonder what area of brooklyn you're in i don't know i got lost looking for the tribeca or something like that because yeah the who area knows? who knows the know. area that i live is like there's an apartment row on the street that i live in in behind all that, it's all just houses. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it's just all houses. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I don't know where I was. I wish I knew because I liked it. It seemed nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, someday if you ever uh, make it to New York. Yeah, well. We'll have I mean, to get together. I, I, I always say that New York is not a place I ever really wanted to go without being invited. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I don't understand big cities very well anyway. And New York is is probably a great place to be if you've got a friend who can show you around and introduce right. you around or whatever, but to show there, to show up there uninvited and kind of try and figure it all out must be very daunting. That's me. <laughs> yeah. I always admire <laughs> people who've done that. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty scary at first. Cause I always tell people, if you're going to move to New York, bring lots of money because you're going <laughs> to run out of it quick. Right. Right. Maybe I'd like uh, for you to talk a little bit about, your true fire course or okay. courses is there do you have more than one yeah i do okay um i i um yeah so true fire has been really a great thing for me um they're a great company and they treat me really well um they're into what i do and they want me to be myself and they're making it possible for me to do that that's what i've heard about them really good and, things other yeah, musicians. Really yeah. they're great guys and fortunately i i don't know compared to anything else but Fortunately, it seems like people are interested in what I'm making, so the sales have been decent. I don't think they're through the roof or skyrocketing or anything, but they're decent, and I think that that makes the company, you know, want to keep making more. Right. Um, so currently, I have eight courses. Oh, cool! I didn't um, know you had and, that many. Yeah. Well, there's there are five that are legit courses that I filmed and, you know, created. And then there are three that are courses that during the early days of the pandemic, they were trying to figure out how they could put out new content. And so I did a couple of camps, like I did one with Frank, Frank Vignola, two, I did two with Frank Vignola. And because Frank and I, Frank had hired me to, to be one of his teachers at the Colorado um, Rocky, Rocky Mountain Archtop Festival, uh, he was going to do a, a gypsy jazz camp right before that, or a, a, a real, you know, a jazz camp. I don't think it was gypsy jazz. Anyway, but that got canceled, so I couldn't go. But we were determined to do some things. He was trying to set something up in Seattle and all this other stuff. Pandemic hit, we didn't do it. But then we ended up doing these nice True Fire things, which were remote, but they cobbled them into courses, which is nice because they're they're not they're you know they're, it's full of good content. It's just not as beautiful to look at. So I have eight courses, three studio shot ones, um, and or no, five studio shot ones and three uh, remote 
ones that they put together. Um, I'm waiting to hear from them about when it, the coast is clear to go and back to Florida and shoot a couple more. Right. Bunch of ideas about what to do. And then I have a True Fire channel, which is something I do myself, which is a $10 a month subscription. I'm happy to say I've got about 160 subscribers now, and they seem happy and satisfied. I put a lot of content up put content up at least bi-weekly and I'm responding to questions and inquiries and various things. Some of the guys have pay a little more and get a, a more private interaction, mm -hmm. video exchange style. And then a lot of the guys take a private lesson from me occasionally as well. Right. So that's very nice. Um, and good, good uh, for you. That sounds like a really cool thing. Yeah, it has. It has been great. And in fact, Pearl Django went away basically which was my my main live playing income. Um, fortunately, not my only income, but True Fire came in right at that moment, and my first check was like the same month we all stopped playing, you know. Mm -hmm. and so I feel like it was, even if that's all it ever, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, but if I never do anything more for True Fire and the sales dwindle down, at least it helped me in that, you know, mm -hmm. moment in 2020 right. and 21. Um, no, but I hope to be able to create a library of good, solid courses in the area of this fluid harmony, uh, melody and harmony living together. Uh, that's the the jazz, the solo jazz pathways, I we call it. That's the, okay. the kind of the brand. And, um, and then also jazz blues pathways, which is my other great love, which is, is sort of um, blues and jazz you know, in a, in a trio or organ trio or, you know, that kind yeah. of greasier style. Yeah. I love that. And, and I, I think I have a couple of more good courses about that in me too. So oh, cool. Um, well, man, you, you must be busy putting up, like thinking of all this content. How do you do that? Like between true fire and the true fire page and YouTube and teaching, and then well, now you're going to hopefully start doing some gigs. Yeah, again. Gigs. yeah. So, so suddenly Timmy's going to be a busy boy, you know, and I don't mind that because if I am not busy, I tend to sort of slip into, you know, a very quiet, I don't hate it, but it's quiet. And I, and I, I'm, because I'm not driven by ambition at this point in my life. So ha having obligations keeps me active and keeps my blood room moving through my veins and, um, and that's that's helpful. Um, Sometime at first, I wanted the channel to have its own content, but I also used some of the content to to get it up and running. I used some of the YouTube content, and and put and then ended up adding to it. Like if there was a performance on YouTube, I would bring that over to the channel and do a lesson on it, shoot a lesson, and then write it up. You know, my in my cryptic little. Uh, Ted Green style chord grids mm -hmm. um, and uh, but with the channel like lately I've been doing things like how to get a gig I shoot a 15 minute video about how to get a gig or and then I'll shoot another video based on questions like how to keep a gig and then uh, shoot another <laughs> yeah, video. that's the hardest part how to keep yeah, the gig right. getting a gig is another video easier. about what how to build a set list how to get ready for you know musically ready to to go looking for a gig you know, and then I'll, because I have all these different subsections, I have the art of the song and I have um, 10 easy pieces, which are, I have to put in some new easy pieces, found out that, surprise, surprise, not very many people could do the, the song arrangements that I had provided. They just physically couldn't do them. So I, yeah. hey, please, Tim, we love it, but make it easier. So yeah. I, you know, I did that. Um Lately, though, on my website, I, I started putting things from my channel on my website as well. And I realized that on the website, the prices are higher, like maybe 10 bucks for one lesson instead of 10 bucks a month. But I also realized that there's two different subsets of customers. Yep that want yeah, different it, things. It's, I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought that up because I'm just going to start doing that this week. Yeah, so if you have a Patreon page and a YouTube channel and you've mon and a website, you've monetized all of them in some fashion. And the truth is, you know, not everybody wants to give their credit card to a company and, and not everybody, you know, uh, uh, 
wants to spend, you know, a piecemeal like a la carte. So you have both things. And I think that right. they play into each other. You know, like, for instance, I was concerned when I started, when I went and did this stuff for, for True Fire and, and all that. I think, well, is my, is my private lessons, you know, which is a, probably the, the most lucrative aspect of my income right now. Um, is that going to disappear? Well, oddly, it got bigger. Mm. Yeah, Teaching only online now, and I'm teaching as much or even a little more than I want to, charging more for it, <laughs> which I'm not happy about, but that seems to be the, the trajectory. Right. Um, and because uh, I always say my mortgage guy and the tax collector doesn't care if I have integrity or not. They just want right. to. <laughs> or the IRS, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. So, yeah. you know, I I feel like I I feel very fortunate. I really that's all I can think of. I'm you know, I feel gratitude and fortune good good fortune to be able to do this thing that you and I both love mm. and and manage to, you know, not be sleeping on somebody's couch. Yeah, mm. I I feel the same way as you. Um I feel like I've been I'm busier now than I was pre-pandemic. Mhm. Mm Oddly enough, it's as yeah. I, if you would have asked me this a year, year and a half ago, I, pro I probably would have told you you were nuts. If yeah, you, yeah. And I'm I'm really happy to get away from live or for performing on this. I like talking. Yeah, I, I, like, I, I like teaching, but I don't want to perform to an imagined audience through this. And, you know. So much about what I love about performing needs to happen with people in a room. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. I've only done a couple of online performances, and it's yeah, I just, have avoided them. Yeah, I just I did a few right at the beginning, and I realized I just it didn't give me a good feeling, yeah. and the result wasn't really very good. And so um, I figured I'll just wait. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well. Let's call it a night. We've been at this for a long time. I know. But, it's uh, going to be like volume four. You're going to have to put <laughs> it out over a year. Well, everyone, I highly encourage you to check out Tim's True Fire courses. Book a lesson with him. I don't think – make him busier. He's not busy. Yeah, yeah I don't mind. I'm, I'm a sucker. <laughs> and uh, Tim has a great YouTube channel as well. I encourage you to check that out as well. Anything uh, else or projects or stuff, courses or anything like that that you'd like people to check out? Or is that pretty much it? I may be doing more solo guitar things as well, because if Pearl Django doesn't reach its former workload, I'll be um, available to do more traveling on my own with my own in doing my own things of, you know, classes and shows and all right. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if there's a demand, I'll go, you know. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much for uh, you, doing yeah. this interview, Tim. Uh, I really, uh, I'm so glad that we got a chance to do this. It is really, really fun. I, I've known of about you and been curious about you and kept my eye on you for a long time. And then recently we gotten chatty and, and friendly. And so um, I, I am very thankful that you reached out and I'm glad we had this wonderful conversation that we have so much in common. I wish you all the best. Your content that I've seen is high quality. I love your sense of humor. I love the fact that your videos are fun to watch. I don't think mine are very fun to watch, but yours are fun to watch, and there's there's cinematic quality to them, which I think is is good because uh, we can uh, that we all benefit from good looking co content. And so all of the all of your viewers who are hopefully still breathing after watching this. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I hope that you'll support Adam and his efforts because the truth is there's no more record companies. There's no more radio stations. There may not even be any more gigs, you know, because a lot of stuff closed down. Yeah. So, you know, even if we don't have to wear masks anymore, we're still left with a kind of an infrastructure that used to barely exist. Now it doesn't exist hardly at all. And uh, we need to support each other in this online realm and it's a small world. It really is a small world. The people who like what we like, I mean, it's not like there's some endless number of them that we, so we can dispose of them. We need to take care of each other. Right. We need to support each other. We need to tell each other about each other. And we need to play music to make this world um, a, a kinder and, and more uh, wholesome and healthy and, and loving place to be. Because 
and we need music and mm -hmm. we're you know we need to either support it or do it or both and so i appreciate you adam for for uh your your part in that oh thank you that's, that's I, I you know that's one of the reasons why i had you on is wow. just supporting each other yeah so anyway tim thank you so much have a good night man all right take care good night you too